Hello, my name is Jesper Jakobsson. I'm currently working at the Hello Centrum in Berlin. And the topic for today's talk is how to create a system for better data management in the perovskite field. For you who are not in the field, what you need to know is that the metal halide perovskites over the last decade has emerged as the brightest shining star among emerging PV materials. And the great potential for perovskites have not only created a hype, but also a large body of literature. And if you search for perovskite solar and web of science, you get more than 16,000 hits. All of those will not be perovskite papers, but most of them are. And it starts to be incredibly hard to keep up to date. And if you are new to the field, it's essentially impossible to catch up. And this is something that will have consequences for how efficient we can do perovskite research. A potential solution to that specific problem would be to collect all perovskite data in one place, which happens to be the goal of the perovskite database project. For our idea is to expand the standard research cycle with an open database where we can collect all perovskite data ever generated and connect this to simple and interactive filtering and visualization tools. And we believe this is something that not only could help us get a better overview of the literature, but also something that could enable entirely new insights, enable new type of projects, help us design better experiments, and thereby accelerate the pace of discovery. This is not a perovskite session, so I will not focus so much on the perovskites themselves, but rather on the process of getting and managing the data. But I will, however, show you one interactive example of what can be done with the tools we have developed. And if you would like to have more of that, you can check out my talk in the Perovskite session. Have you ever wondered what it would look like if you could present all of Perovskite solar cell science in only one figure? Wonder no more. We have it here, where we have a hex beam plot of the performance as a function of publication date for almost every Perovskite device properly described in the literature. And if you have all data consistently formatted and found in one place. There's a lot of very interesting things you can do. Another typical user example is this. Imagine that you're a new PhD student and you're told that your mission in life is to plot out coated perovskites. Then you can go here and with a simple command, you could filter out all data for all slot out coated perovskites available. And you can get this data in tabular form and you can download that data, which gives you a good entry point to the key publications that you should look at further. And once you have this data filtered out, you can start to separate it along a long range of different dimensions related to, for example, materials and properties and synthetic procedures. And what we'll show you here is an example of how to separate the data with respect to the solvent system used during the perovskite deposition during slot eye coating. And this is a fairly complex example in the sense that answering the question of how the solvent system affected the perovskite deposition previously is a question that required quite a lot of work to answer. Whereas here in this system, we can visualize the answer to that question within about a minute, as we see here. Once we have done that, we can start to ask additional questions like how important is the solvent atmosphere and the so and the annealing temperature of the perovskite, for example, or a long range of other questions. And we can also start to compare different choices, like here, how important is the choice of electron transport layers or the choice of perovskite compositions. And trust me, you could easily spend hours and hours filtering through the data, trying to make sense of the perovskites, but also trying to figure out what are the experiments that should be done but haven't been done yet. I need to say a few words about the data we have. Ideally, we would like to have everything, but we also have to start somewhere. And in the initial projects, we have limited ourselves to device data, device metadata, and key performance metrics. And those parameters can be divided, as you see in the figure here, where we have reference information, cell definition, like how big is the cell, is it semi-transparent, is it flexible, is it a module? And then we have the device stack, where we have all the functional layers in the stack, like the electron transport layers, the perovskite, the whole transport layer, and so on. 
For each of those layers, we want to know the properties, like the band gap, the transparency, and the thickness, and so on. And for each material, we want to know the synthetic details, like what are the chemicals and solvents and dopants involved, and what are the deposition procedures and conditions. And finally, we want to have the key metrics in terms of IV metrics, QE metrics, stability, and outdoor testing. All in all, we have looked for about 100 parameters per device in the initial data hunt. We have also developed protocols for future use where we can capture up to 400 parameters per device. Unfortunately, every device is not as well described as we would like it to be, and we could talk about the taxonomy of data extractability. And most importantly, is what we could call data of the first order. And here we have data for the champion devices, and that data is almost always available. And it is, after all, the data people like to brag about. It's data that show who good things can be, and they tend to be the centerpiece of the story. And then we have what we call data of the second order, which is data for all other devices found in the papers that make up the statistical justification for the story. This data is usually harder to extract as it may not be found in tablet form, but you may only find it in terms of scatter plots or average values. And finally, we have it called data of the third order, which data for all devices that due to some reasons didn't make it into published papers. And historically, data for those devices is very, very hard to find and essentially lost forever, which is something we hope to be able to change in the future. So even if you can't get data for every device ever made, we still have more than 16,000 published papers, multiple devices per paper and 100 parameters per device. And this may sound like a lot of work, and indeed, it's been a huge effort to get all that data. And this is not something I could do alone, so I needed volunteers. And I simply asked everyone I know and I've worked with before if they would be willing to help me in this. And the response has been overwhelmingly positive, and I've been able to gather a team of around 90 persons around the globe that have helped me going through the literature. And before I continue, I would like to acknowledge all the crew workers. Without those, this project wouldn't have been possible. And I would also like to acknowledge the funding, which is a European project to which I'm grateful for, they pay my salary. The back end we have used for data collection is in the form of a simple Excel template, which is a solution with both benefits and drawbacks. But some of the most important benefits are this fairly simple and straightforward to use, and that it enables other things to build on top of it, like for example, routines for automatic data entry connected to experimental equipment. A data collection effort like this is challenging, and here are a few insights I have gained along the way. First of all, do not spend an eternity trying to design the perfect solution, because then you will never get started. And by the way, a perfect solution doesn't exist. So I would say it's better to get started straight away and be prepared to modify your solution as you go along and learn what works and doesn't. And if your instructions are incomplete, it will be chaos. But even if your instructions are good, it will be messy because they will be interpreted differently, which means that you have to design systems that make it easy to do right and hard to do wrong, while simultaneously not being too complicated or time consuming to work. And this is a very real challenge. And if you, for example, have free text options, you will get a remarkable amount of spelling variations, which you have to deal with. But at the same time, it's tricky to list options and alternatives when you do not know them in advance. An illustration of that problem is that the number of uni unique device stacks reported in literature exceeds 4,000. And in a project like this, be prepared that your time plan will not hold. And even after you have collected all the data, someone has to spend time to check the data for consistency and correctness. And I think I spent about four months straight doing nothing else than that. But even after that, there will be errors in the data set. And that's something you have to accept and something you have to deal with by designing a system that enables self-corrections along the way. We have managed to extract data for around 40,000 devices. And this represents most of the devices ever made where someone have thought it worth the effort 
to describe the device in sufficient details in a paper so that data for that device is possible to extract. That means on average less than six devices per paper containing original device data, whereas the total number of devices ever made probably is around two orders of magnitude larger. And this represents a huge data loss. But in the future, we hope to be able to collect also that data and enter it into the Perisky database. If you look into the future, in a worst case scenario, we will publish an interesting data set and a nice paper, and then nothing more will happen. That would still be a decent outcome, but I think this could be so much better than that. And in a best case scenario, the Perisky community will embrace this as a valuable resource and start to upload their own data in the future and thereby start to build what you can call a Wikipedia of Perisky science. And if we succeed in this, we could stay up to date and when people upload their own data, we can get data for far more devices, not just a few highlighted in papers. And we can also get that data with a more fine-grained data mess. And we can also expand the projects to include data for non-device related parameters, as well as links to the original data sets. This is still a work in progress, but if editors and reviewers are nice and supportive, we will be online before Christmas. And by then, you will be able to find all the resources at www.peruskitedatabase.com. And with that, I have probably used up my time. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, or if you would like to have any assistance with utilizing the resources we have developed, or if you would like to discuss any follow-up projects or something else, please send me an email.